News Talk, the Saturday panel with John Duggan. We're on air until 8 o'clock this evening. Uh, this week, we're dedicating the panel to strength and conditioning in sport and the areas of sports science and sports psychology. So the Irish s and Conference in 2022 taking place next Saturday, May the 14th in Bishopstown J Club in County Cork. The organiser is David Nolan. You're the co-director of the Irish s and Network. You're also a PhD researcher in female athletes and nutrition. You're very welcome. Thanks very much, John. Thanks for having us. Talk us about the conference. Yeah, so it's the first conference of its kind taking place in Ireland to, to this scale. So it's bringing together the Irish strength and conditioning community and sports performance community next week down in Bishop Sound GA. So we've 10 world-class speakers that have worked right along the spectrum of performance at inter-county level, NFL in the States and right with the Olympic champions. So it's a great collective of people there next weekend. We also joined by Des Ryan in studio. Des, you're the Director of Coaching and Performance at Satanta College, the former Head of Sports Medicine and Athletic Development at Arsenal FC. You're very welcome, Des. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yeah, looking forward to talking about all things strength and conditioning. Uh, while I, you're on that, the, the, the phrase S&C, when I hear about it, Des, like... Um, does the person on the street know exactly what it is? So um, when I was kind of doing a bit of research into this panel today, strength and conditioning, are we talking about strength work, muscle work? Are we talking about aerobic endurance, like power, like speed, um, and, and the things you think about when you're talking about aerobic exercise? So uh, running, walking, cycling, uh, you know, high-intensity interval training. Is this all about competitive sport mainly, Des? S and C, what's the definition just to start us off, I suppose? Yeah, sure. It, it, there's a place for it everywhere, from participation to community sport to talent development to elite. Uh, there are similarities right through. I go very wide. I talk about health, well-being and physical development. And the, the strength and conditioning practitioners uh, the the uh, competent uh, and confident ones can help in so many areas movement uh, speed endurance strength um, and as i say well-being just doing a good quality athletic development program with a strength and conditioning coach can help your concentration your memory uh, in school studies and i think it's something that should be ingrained in the whole community uh, from primary school uh, to our elderly population uh, to the general population and of course we can go to a deeper level with the talent development phases and the elite athletes and it can get very enjoyable but there's something there for everyone. Just better posture, moving well, um, strength that can make life easier for you, uh, the reducing the risk of injury, enjoying sport, self-esteem, there's so much to be gained for it and, and a good conditioner can work well with a player, with an athlete, with a coach, with all those uh, people that contribute to sport. An activity. We're also joined by Dr. Aoife Lane on the line there, the head of sports science uh, department at TUS Athlone and a chair of the GA Sports Science Advisory Committee. And Aoife, perhaps you could talk about strength and conditioning in terms of how it's become a key component to sports science and what you do day to day. Yeah, like I guess sports science in itself, I, I, I was meeting parents a couple of weeks ago at an open evening and the classic thing is what can I become um, if I study sports science? And sports science has many fields to it. it it's based on kind of your psychology, physiology, biomechanics, but one of the applied components of sports science is strength and conditioning. There's also nutrition, performance analysis, coaching. Um, so it is a massively common area. It's one piece of, of a big puzzle around a sports scientist. And generally when you do an undergraduate program, you're a generalist and you're able to do well on all of those things. And you find that a lot of people progress through the SNC. It's got really common. You know, I think it's pervasive across all sports now that there's almost an SNC or an athletic development coach as long, uh, along with the coach. Um, so it's something that people realize that that athleticism is is central to performance in sport. And look at a lot of us would like that it, it, it occurs through the sport and through the coaching itself. But I think there is a space, even back to what Des was saying, even youth physical activity guidelines now, they encourage muscle and bone strengthening at least three days a week. So it, it is a part of our physical activity guidelines. It's a, it is a part of health and well-being. So I suppose it, it follows that we have these professionals and practitioners supporting um, everybody across the lifespan to embed it in their, their daily living. And we're also joined by Hugh Gilmore, who's a performance psychologist with Team B. Uh, Hugh, thanks for joining the Saturday panel today. And uh, like a huge amount of difference in the sports you work with, uh, Hugh, in terms of you work with British weightlifting, you've worked with netball. Um, so how does the approach uh, differ when it comes to S&C and what you do? 
Well, as a psychologist, I suppose the idea is for me is the mindset of a person whenever they're approaching training and approaching performance is different. Um, the concept that I suppose I would put across is that the development and the process of developing strength and developing your ability to be in a conditioned state for performance is learned and that you have to learn how to develop and within psychology, that's a large part of it, how you think about the challenges you face, whether it be through commitment and, and training or actually it comes down to interpersonal demands of working with a team that support you. So across all of those, there's actually a lot more similarities than there are differences because it is essentially people, how they think about it and how they interact with other people who are trying to help them. So we've had Niall Moyna on the show before, Des, uh, speaking with Joe Molloy, brilliant chats that they've had about general fitness for the population. So is there a type of SNC program that's kind of mandatory for all athletes? Are there kind of things that have to be in there or is it like a more of a one size fits all or is it more about tailoring it to different sports? It, yeah, it, it, it can be adapted, but there's, there's fundamentals within it. And the fundamentals, I suppose, would be movement, being able to move well, mobility and stability. Um, for the younger people, mastering those fundamental movement skills, running, jumping, etc. And once you have those masters, you can mastered, you can move on to more more advanced type exercises. And then, yeah, the sports they vary. I was lucky enough to work in in soccer. I, I call it football when I'm in England, but on in Ireland, soccer, and then rugby and and the Gaelic sports. And there's fundamentals again that the players have to master, but once they've earned the right, they can do much more exciting stuff like like contrast training, uh, etc. Olympic lifting, um, uh, power work, uh, plyometrics. Oh, uh, but you have to earn the right for that. You have to get the training age. You have to have a good coach with you. You have to have an understanding as a player and a good player coach relationship. But once you do that, there can be an amazing feats of athleticism uh, and help to the players. Um, like the Bakayo Sakas of this world, an extremely powerful player. And, and the coaches in Arsenal had him from under 12. And he was doing appropriate content, learning how to run properly, learning his exercises. And over the years, it's amazing the um, additional power, speed, athleticism that, that a good athletic development coach can provide. What was it like working on Arsenal, Des? Oh, great fun. Enjoyable. I learned so much. Different worlds. The Premier League is a different world. Uh, great people over there. Um, Arsene Wenger did instill amazing values within Arsenal. I, I could feel them as soon as I arrived. I could I could understand them. They have a clear philosophy of play over there, learning from Liam Brady, uh, Per Matisakar is carrying that through with the academy, highly technical players, playing between the thirds, comfortable on the ball. They want high speed players, high speed repeatability. And, and the club is, is pushing in one way to develop players. And, and it's, it's worked for them well with, with Emil, with Eddie, Niketia, uh, Joe Willock now up in, up in Newcastle, Serge Gnarby came through there, Hector Bellerin, um, Isaac Hayden in Newcastle, loads of, of good quality players coming through that, that fantastic academy, um, but a, a different world for sure. Uh, when you talk about values there, Des, do you get a sense of who's gonna make it and who isn't? It, it is one of the hardest things to do it, it's in trick it. Uh, when you do work with a club like Arsenal, there is a lot of talented players. And, and literally from 2013 when I arrived, I know every player who was there at under 18. Now, when you're at under 18, you've committed to full-time football. And I followed them through, and literally there's only about, uh, I, I have to check it every year, but there's about 10 that aren't playing in professional football. So that's a lot who, who are playing in professional football, but those, one of them's working in the city, there's a few teachers, there's a personal trainer. They've, they've got on well because of, of the holistic development there. But yeah, it's tricky to spot that talent. Like Hector Bellerin, I don't think anyone was singing from the treetops that he's going to be a senior Arsenal player, a captain, but Arsene Wenger did. He spotted him, he was one of the few. It was amazing, just one pre-season, he invited him up, and then he was with the senior team from, from that point on, pretty much. So there's some talented people that can see that. People like strength and conditioners can help with that. Understanding late developers, like maturation, understanding speed, power qualities, looking at their outputs on the game, making an informed decision, along with the psychologist, along with the scouts, along with the coaches. It's, 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 a, it's a complex but interesting world, talent development. You must have seen some things, Des. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was good fun over there. I. I what could I tell you now that, that won't get me in trouble? 
Um, yeah, uh, an interesting day. We, we, we were big into CPD, Continuous Professional Development, and all the coaches were in one room, upstairs room. Per Matasacker there was there, the, man the academy manager. We had a guest speaker in, and suddenly one of the conditioners bursts out laughing. And I'm there, uh-oh, and Per has given me dagger eyes, and it's not appropriate in, in that environment in the workshop, so Per says, you need to talk to that conditioner, and I, I went, I won't say his name. Conditioner, what, what, what were you doing? Why were you laughing? And he went, well, a bang yang just drove in in a unicorn coloured car. <laughs> <laughs> I went, okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, now we so, know why he's not at the club anymore, I guess. <laughs> it was a nice car. It was a Lamborghini, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so different things happened every day like that. It was fascinating. You worked in with Kildare, did you, in Kildare GA? Yeah, uh, that David. was during my undergraduate, my first kind of proper SNC role. I, I was lucky to come in and assist with the, the minors under Jason Ryan's time. Um, and I think that year we, we won a Leinster final, beating the Dubs. So it's, right. it's always a good year when yeah. you beat the Dub. And I think we just lost out to Tipperary in, this, in the All Ireland semi finals that year. But yeah, that, that was a, my kind of first big experience in SNC, I would say. So the do's and don'ts, what are they in terms of SNC? In terms of S&C, um, well, I suppose the first is, is understanding what it is. And Des gave a, a great um, definition of it there because fundamentally strength and conditioning has two main priorities. One is to make you better at your sport. If it doesn't make you better at performing the skills of your sport, you're, you're doing it wrong. And the second is to reduce injury risk. So I suppose the, the biggest don't is don't try to rush the process. Um, training age takes a long time to, to develop. People try to rush that process and that puts you at um, increased risk of injury and burnout because it's, it's not my phrase, but you can't have a baby in four and a half months by trying twice as hard. Things take time and adaptations take time to develop. And I think we, we see it maybe in some youth players that try to rush the process and maybe try to get too strong or too big too quickly. Um, in rugby, for example, we, we tend to see it. And... People always want to be that breakthrough athlete that gets onto the senior team or the first team at 18, 19 years of age. But they're few and far between where when we develop, say, if I look at male rugby athletes, for example, we don't want them as big as they're going to be at 18 years of age. We want to get someone through the academy system. At If you give me an athlete at 18 that can move well, can perform all their, their exercise and their lifts well, it's easy to make that person big and strong in a year or two. You get someone at 18 that maybe has poor training, didn't listen to their coaches coming up through the way, they can't move well. Well, you take a year or two just trying to undo the bad habits and we can't load them up then. Where with rugby players, it's where do we want you to be at 22, 23 years of age? What is the target for you then when you're coming into your prime and can have a big impact where people tend to, to rush that process? Has it gone over the top in schools rugby, the bulking up? I, I wouldn't say it's gone over the top because again, especially in Leinster schools we see the the performance outcomes the outcomes are fantastic it's a fantastic system and we have um, great players so I think when it's done properly and appropriately it hasn't gone over the top I think people that say it's gone over the top are the ones that look at the extreme examples of maybe children that have gone and done it by themselves or have gone with the misguided way where SNC should be integrated from youth development the whole way up if young guys and girls they're going to go to the gym they're going to lift weights regardless of what we say so we might as well integrate it into the school system that from a young age they're developed and shown how to do it appropriately and there's someone there to help them along with the process and that's even probably more important for um, female athletes I would say at this point because culturally and within the sport there's a big gap we see the typical rugby player when they come to 18 years of age has maybe been in the gym four or five years at that stage where the typical 18-year-old female rugby athlete mightn't have ever been exposed to gym training at that stage, where if we give them the same resource and opportunity and expose them to the same strength and conditioning pathway, we'd probably see a big difference in both the performance and the injury risks in those sports. Yeah, Aoife, you founded the Women's GPA, and how have you uh, found the different approaches towards men and women's sport in terms of S&C and sports science, and what has been your experience and what can we work on? Yeah, I think David probably captured it there. I think it's across the board in, in a lot of sports. Maybe the individual sports are probably doing a little bit better. My experience is always more on the, the big three and the team ones. And we have what David is saying. We probably have a bit of a gap around the, the training environment that we have for female athletes. Um, 
just this morning on Twitter, I saw at least a handful of men's uh, talent development squads meeting up and having their SNC with them and uh, possibly little nutrition and psychology. You rarely see that on the women's side. And I think to develop that robust athlete who's able to perform at a high level, and, and as David said, manage injury risk, we do need to look seriously around that development pathway for female athletes. Yes, around participation, but also around performance. Um, you know, we, we might sometimes look at women's sport and say, oh, it's not as good um, or it's not the standard isn't as high or we don't have enough players. You see that massively with the rugby now. That's probably because of the gendered environment they're coming through around the training supports that we're giving them. So, I mean, on a Gaelic game side, there probably has been some progress due to kind of investment from the government, really. Um, there's, there's money out there now that supports teams to invest in performance supports. But I think there's still a, a sliding scale around what a typical men's intercounty environment would look like and what a female one would. And, you know, that, that's, that's ultimately an issue because already then we're creating a disadvantaged environment for girls. And, you know, it's, it's easy to blame or it might be, I suppose, the easy thing to blame them for not doing so well. But we really have to shine the mirror on the broader, the broader picture. You're working as well, David, in rugby at the moment, aren't you, in terms of research in women's rugby athletes? Yeah, so my PhD research looks at sex differences in ad adaptation to training. So basically looking at do males and females need to train differently and some of the, the considerations around that and, you know, stuff like the menstrual cycle, hormonal contraceptives, do they influence performance? But I suppose some of the more interesting research, it hasn't been published yet, uh, we would have interviewed the coaches of eight of the international women's rugby teams, so some of the top ranked international women's rugby teams, just to get their attitudes and do they train males and females differently and if so, why? And it's it's interesting what comes out in that is, yes, they train them differently, but it's not because they are female. It's not due to their physiology. It's rather the average player just hasn't the same technical ability or the same training age under the belt compared to males. So if they were as technically as capable, they would train them the same. But because they haven't had the same exposure to S&C coming up through the ranks, they're, they're forced maybe to train them a little more um, at a, a lower level. Any questions for the panel? Uh, folks out there, 53106, you can get in touch on our text number. Uh, we're speaking here to David Nolan. Um, who is the director, uh, co-director of the Irish SNC Network? Hugh Gilmore, performance psychologist with Team GB. Aoife Lane, the head of sports science department at TUS Athlone and chair of the GA Sports Science Advisory Committee. And Des Ryan, director of coaching and performance at Satanta College, formerly with Connacht and Arsenal. And Hugh, just before the break, Ronnie O'Sullivan won the World Snooker last week, and I'm thinking to myself, snooker is not really a sport that I'm going to be uh, naturally associating with SNC. But he's 46 years of age. He's breaking records. He runs all the time. He eats well. And keeping the body in a harmonious state helps the mind. And I'm sure you've found that in the various different disciplines you've worked with in, in the sporting realm. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a massive benefit from uh, exercise to benefit, obviously, the psychological state of well-being. However, I think the other thing is that, you know, we shouldn't just say because somebody's 46 that they're not still a good athlete. So the snooker isn't actually physically demanding, but actually it's a sign of athleticism to be able to maintain a skill that is obviously about precision and accuracy and also do that under pressure. One of the biggest things that happens with people like Ronnie O'Sullivan is whenever you've done such a good job, people continually expect a good job. And if you continually expect to do a good job, that's an immense state of pressure. So again, I'm aware Ronnie does uh, has worked with a psychologist in the past. And again, you know, dealing with that pressure is obviously a component of an athletic, uh, well, an athletic performance, which is snooker, maybe not physically, but definitely mental, mentally and also from a skill component. And also managing anxiety, competition anxiety as well. That's a big thing, isn't it, Hugh? Yeah, I mean, it depends on how you how you see that anxiety manifest. I mean, it could be anxiety from a mental health perspective is obviously people uh, having either thoughts that are anxiety provoking or feelings that are anxiety provoking. Provoking, And one of the things you'll often see with snooker players is them stopping and, and calming and taking a couple of deep breaths. And that's something that's going to help with their anxiety and lower their levels. But it might also be working on their confidence, like what's the source of that anxiety? So again, yeah, I mean, if you're up for a big performance, there's opportunity for nerves, but we actually don't know how you felt. So it's really, you know, it's a supposing from the outside looking in. It's not always good to judge and put, put things out there as an external perspective.
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, we've got to take a break here. Stay with us for more chat on the Saturday panel with uh, Hugh Gilmore. Aoife Lane, Des Ryan and David Nolan on strength and conditioning in sports, sports science and psychology. You can get in touch on our text number 53106. Just before we go to the break, just to give you some, some scores because uh, the championship is finishing today and also Scotland, Celtic have beaten Hearts 4-1. Effectively, that is the title now. Uh, they've got it pretty much wrapped up today, Celtic. So well done, Ange Postacoglu, when the Celtic players a 4-1 win over Hearts in the Scottish Premiership today. In the Championship, it is Birmingham nil, Blackburn Rovers 2, Bournemouth nil, Millwall nil, Derby nil, Cardiff 1, Huddersfield Town 2, Bristol City nil, Hull nil, Nottingham Forest nil, Luton 1, Reading nil. It is Peterborough 2, Blackpool 0, Preston 3, Middlesbrough 1, Sheffield United 4, Fulham 0, it is Stoke 1, Coventry 1, it is Swansea 0, QPR 0 and West Brom 4, Barnsley 0. All of those matches are into the second half. What it means is that the playoff spots will be occupied by Huddersfield Town, Nottingham Forest, Sheffield United and Luton Town. I just let you know in the Premier League, 3 o'clock starts for the big game. Burnley against Aston Villa, Brentford versus Southampton, Chelsea against Wolves, Crystal Palace against Watford, a half-five kick-off for Brighton against Manchester United this evening and then at 7.45 this evening Liverpool against Tottenham in the Premier League will Liverpool go top of the table tonight 53106 for the text on our panel we're back after the news here on Off The Ball Saturday on News Talk and this is Off The Ball Saturday on News Talk John Duggan with you through until 8 o'clock this evening because we commentary Len- Le- later of Leinster against Leicester in the Champions Cup you can text us 53106 so this week's Saturday panel is all about strength and conditioning in sport the areas of sports science and psychology we're continuing the conversation with David Nolan the co-director of the Irish SNC Network and a PhD researcher in female athletes and nutrition Des Ryan the uh, director of coaching and performance at Satanta College former head of sport medicine and athletic development at Arsenal Dr Aoife Lane head of the sports science department at TUS Athlone and chair of the GA Sports Science Advisory Committee and Hugh Gilmore, performance psychologist with Team GB. The Irish SNC Conference, you must listen now, is taking place next Saturday, May the 14th at Bishopstown GA Club in County Cork. The interactive conference will bring together the best minds and practitioners in strength and conditioning for a series of talks, panel discussions, workshops, networking opportunities, tickets available for the event at irishscnetwork.com forward slash Conference 2022. So you can listen to this panel on News Talk. Watch us as well on the digital and social channels for House Cup and Twitter, out off the ball, YouTube, Facebook, and on the OTB Sports app. Got a question from a current GA Intercounty star, uh, Des. I'm going to put to you now. I've got a theory that if you throw the same S and C at two lads, both will respond differently. So some guys are just better because they got better genes. So I compare it to, say, the 100 metres or 10,000 metres in the Olympics. Many people train incredibly hard, but ultimately they cannot compete for medals against the top, top guys. They could also not train any harder. I think Dublin were blessed with a few athletic freaks that responded incredibly well to being the training prescribed to them as being class footballers. May were able to compete with them as they were the only top team with a few genetic freaks around the middle. Is it the case that Limerick hurlers are just in a sweet spot at the moment? because they've got a few lads with the right frame and genes to absorb this s and work and that no matter how hard some other counties work, their current crop of players will never be as physically dominant. Interesting insight, yes. So the way I'd look at that is um, it's not all about strength and conditioning. That's, that's a bit of a narrow way of looking at it. You've got to look at it as technical, tactical. There were some fantastic players in many sports that weren't that gifted genetically in terms of, of athleticism. And would I be unfair in mentioning some? Maybe, but I'm complimenting them. If we look at Ronan O'Gara, what a player. What a fantastic technical player. Maybe not the quickest, maybe not the strongest, but if we looked at it in just that lens, maybe we wouldn't have had Ronan O'Gara. Um, Porrick Joyce, not the quickest. Great agility, great speed of mind worked so hard on his pace to be able to compete at that high level. So we really should look at this holistically and not, not too narrow. And, and the way I'd start that was as many people playing, as many people being supported in terms of athletic development, the better. That's the way a national governing body should do. And then when you have a wide pool, you'll find Brian Fenton's, you'll find Keith Higgins, you'll find more of them. And the more people we have active, the more people we support, uh, the more people will be healthy and, and, and active for life and playing with their clubs, but the more that will flow through to the elite level. And there's hope for everyone. Uh, we can help everyone as strength conditioners. And I'm, I'm getting the flashback to a young player, uh, Dominic Thompson. And literally at, at 15, 
even I was looking at him going, I don't think he'll make it as a professional footballer. He may have to focus more and more and more on his studies. But he did a huge amount of work with Paddy Roach, the conditioner over there from, from Tipperary and Arsenal Academy, Perry Stewart. And he's, he's, play, he's contracted to Brentford, he's playing with Ipswich Town on loan. Uh, he, he made immense improvements in his power, in his speed, uh, beyond what you'd expect. So you can always improve, every player can improve. The wider the base, the better, the more support, the better. It's not all about athleticism. So athleticism can help. Uh, as I say, uh, strength and conditioning won't win you a competition, but maybe you can't win a competition without strength and conditioning. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't give up hope on other counties, other provinces, other sports. Uh, widen the base, support players. It's not all about athleticism, but that can help all players, not just the players that are predisposed genetically. And, well, I think it's important to understand the listeners, correct, like even we can look at research. We know if we throw the same program at two different people, they're going to respond quite differently. And there's a lot of factors that drive that. But that just, first of all, everyone does respond. People will rep- improve. It's just maybe at different rates. But it's just about then having to adjust and adapt. Like speed is one, for example. Not everyone is going to be fast, but everyone can get faster. But if you are never going to be the fastest person, well, then you have to adapt and change other areas of your game. Because I do always say you can be five yards quicker than your marker or five yards smarter. And that's what you tend to see is great players. People say, oh, you know, they, they find the space. That's a bit inaccurate. Great players make the space and they manufacture it because they manipulate their opponents. If they know they're not faster, they will use misdirection or they'll manipulate the variables of the game to create that space and then run into it. Yeah, Hugh, the mind is very important. Like I looked the other night, Manchester City, you might think are the better football team, but Real Madrid had something in them. Patrick Harrington won three majors. A lot of players that are more talented than him didn't win any majors. Sometimes the way the person both trains their body but also trains their mind to approach these things is hugely important at the elite level, isn't it? I think what's interesting is that question exposed the mindset of that person where they've actually overinflated or over overgeneralized one component of performance uh, as being over important and because of that then if we view things as being over important we've over focused on it and actually it, it limits our ability to see a broader perspective of how we can improve performance i think the other thing is it gives out uh, the understanding of that person's performance as being potentially additive in that we add in a brick of s and c we add in another brick of uh, good coaching we add in another brick of nutrition and we think of performance as a wall we're building but actually that's not performance the human system is more like a soup and uh, it's complex it's dynamic and it interacts you add in a little bit of s and c you see how somebody responds you add in some recovery you add in uh, good coaching you add in interpersonal dynamics and then you see how it responds and then the coach shapes that so performance should be thought more so of something that's complex dynamic and changing than it is you just add in a brick of S&C to build a performance wall because that doesn't add up. Uh, Aoife, uh, we have a text in here um, on uh, 53106. I've got a seven-year-old boy talented and engaged at training but does not look interested in engaged in matches. We always praise hard work and effort, but we cannot get him to get stuck into the match even though it's his choice to go. He's never forced to go. Uh, you're currently supervising PhD students looking at the contribution of organised sport to physical, physical activity. It's important for young kids to hit the ground running just in terms of competing and feeling um, part of something. And I would say to that... Uh, child's parents just stick at it um, I'm sure it'll, it'll get better for them um, because it's, it's it's just a case of being a part of a social group getting your health right and, and feeling part of a part of a team yeah um, I think it was seven maybe yeah, you yeah. Said, yeah the kid was so very much I mean at that age um, in Gaelic games if it's Gaelic games or I imagine in any sport it's it's nursery focused it's goal games focused and anyone who looks into the, the background of them they're brilliant concepts it's, it's all about just participation and playing and there's absolutely no comp- competition at all. It's it's enjoyment. Um, development is a good is a big thing. And Des mentioned earlier FMS and physical literacy, and that's really what we're about at that point. Every sport, you know, in Ireland, and it's in the national sports policy, should be you know coming together and going. We, all we want here is that kids are being developed to a stage that they're able to play all sports or as many as they want, and they can specialise as they progress. So for that little kid, definitely, I mean, I think we've eighty percent of primary school boys and girls play sport. But that drops to 60% of boys or 66, two thirds of boys in, in secondary school and about 50% of girls in secondary school. So 
that parent is doing an amazing job. They're they're doing that thing, and the club is doing an amazing job. We're getting the kids in, but there, there's some sort of slippage, and and that's the issue that we're seeing in some of our our projects in in our um, in Athlone is that we are feeling and seeing that drop off. It's it's more pronounced in girls than boys. Um, I think to that parent again, for kids to stay, they need to feel they're getting better. You know, it's you need to be developing. You need to feel you're developing some kind of competency as well as enjoying it. So sometimes we over egg the fun and enjoyment. It's also important that they're improving because that helps them to stay as well when they feel that they can compete against the other kids and they don't feel like they're out of place. I get that they're not good at it. So it's I think it's doable as well to bring both together to have that enjoyment and have that little skill development um, and bring kids through. They need they need both to stay. Yeah, you're on a GA uh, sports science working group. You're chairing that at the moment, Aoife. What are the kind of key um, objectives or, or things that you're working on at the moment in this realm? Lots of stuff the guys mentioned and, and Hugh picked up on it there around that sometimes we get a bit, a little bit one-dimensional on, on sports science maybe being about one or two things. What we're looking at is all of the disciplines of sports science and we've got really good leads and representatives of nutrition uh, athletic development and Des is involved in that in that element, uh, physiotherapy and rehabilitation, performance analysis, um, mental performance and well-being. Um, I'm going to forget one now because I always do. But we've, we've a great group of people and what we want is to build a framework for sports science across the whole player pathway in Gaelic games. So uh, sports science is relevant to that seven year old. They're not going to be doing athletic development, obviously, but they're going to be doing their FMS. And that knowledge that we have around, I suppose, developing that skill development is important there. So we have a great group of people together who are trying to, I suppose, provide that space. Maybe there's a bit of a vacuum, I think, in Gaelic games at the minute around where does sports science fit? What does it look like? Who should be delivering it? How can the Gaelic game system support that delivery? And um, there's loads of activity. It's, I mean, the ship has sailed. There's, there's so much stuff happening from clubs right through to talent into county. So we're trying to put a little bit of shape on that and provide a little bit of leadership. And obviously clubs and counties and provinces will always innovate and we always want that. Um, but for us, I think we need to give that kind of guide around what should be done at what stage by who and to protect the practitioner um, because it, it's a minefield. There's, there's a lot of practitioners involved in Gaelic Games. Very few of them probably have any type of service line agreement or contract. There's very few have these standards around accreditation. There's very few accreditation opportunities in some instances. So. Um, sports science is a big, it's a big thing, it's a big deal. We have a lot of courses in Ireland producing sports science graduates, a lot of postgraduate courses then bringing them on another level. So I think we we owe them uh, a little bit of work here as well to provide a nice work environment and a supportive work environment. Is there too much burnout in GAA in your view, Aoife? Ah, oh, like it's a tricky one because I think, you know, when you're the youth, again, coming back to me with physical activity, every kid should be doing at least an hour there, thereabouts of moderate to vigorous physical activity every day. I think the burnout happens when we make it too competitive. So if a kid is going down playing in, in the local pitch and they're getting some nice coaching and they're enjoying it and it's very games based and it's fun and participation oriented, that's not a bad thing. I think where we're letting the system down and burnout is creeping in and, and you would be much better placed to pick up on this than me is when it comes into that competitive environment and then you start to bring in that stress and worry. And I think that's where you you, you really, you know, you, you see that burnout happen. And then again, with inter-county players, it's 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 trying to balance, you know, all the demands that they have. But I, I'll defer to the expert on that one. And I, he's sitting looking at me here if he wants to You, in. take it away. <laughs> well, it's interesting. The, the question was about the parents saying they won't get stuck into the games uh, the as their seven-year-old. And that's the parents' own judgment. That's the parents' demands on their child. Why are we not asking, what does a child want to get stuck into? What does a child enjoy? Because that's the actual question that we need to be asking as coaches. What do they get out of it? Not our demands that they go on and represent the county and whatever else. But I think, you know, if we go on to, to look at burnout, one of the things that's really interesting is gamification. If you look at video games, how video games are set up is that you can go and have a go at something you can fail and have as many goals as you want and there's continual small and big rewards as you go along and that's why video games are successful they're, they're psychologically uh designed to encourage you and if you think about it like if you were to design a GAA coaching practice or any sport practice how would you design it like a video game how would the coach behave like a video game to enhance performance and adherence and and essentially the child's development because we have a lot to learn from other areas which children are getting interested in um 
I'm not, I mean, I'm not gonna go there, but TikTok, I mean, look at the way that's set up. It's set up to be addictive because they create things, do things, get rewarded for it. I mean, how do we learn from those things which are attracting kids and bring those into sport? Yeah, I don't use TikTok, but I get what you're saying, um, Hugh. <laughs> uh, 53106, uh, how do you fix the core curling football teams? I don't think any of us will maybe be able to do that, to be honest, on the panel today. Somebody else is complaining about why we're t- talking about this. It's one of the biggest sporting weekends of the year. F- listener, we're on air until 8 o'clock this evening. We've got live and exclusive commentary of Leinster against Leicester. We've got football Saturday between 3 and 5. We've got everything covered. We've got a six-hour show tomorrow here on News Talking Off the Ball. Everything's grand. Everything is cool. A very interesting discussion here on strength and conditioning. 53106. Uh, Des Ryan, any tips on strength and conditioning for a 50-year-old male, says Aidan. Yeah, good question. And I'm heading there myself. So <laughs> it's it should be part of your lifestyle. It should be um, uh, a based about movement again, because we teach young people to master these movements. And as we get older, those movements regress. So we still should be holding on to those. Like I was OK at surfing, but my squat pattern has regressed a bit as I got older. I need to work on that so I can get back at surfing. Um, it's just as important as the adult, as the youth, as the adolescent, as the child. And find a good strength conditioner would be the tip. Um, do it at a time that you suit you, that you enjoy. Um, find someone you click with uh, and then make sure that that program becomes part of your, your, your uh, timetable, your habit, your lifestyle. And, and it just has to be every second day. And you might be lifting barbells and you're 50. Excellent. You might be lifting dumbbells, doing athletic development. It looks like what the the Munster Leinster team will be doing. Maybe a little bit less load. Still good technique. Amazing benefits from that for longevity. And David Nolan, why is muscle mass important to retain it as you get older? What's the the science behind that? Um, so, so I'm fortunate enough. My PhD is under Dr. Brendan Egan, kind of leading figure in, in healthy aging, and it, it's it's crucial. Muscle mass is probably maybe overlooked or underappreciated when it comes to our health. There's a very strong relationship between how much muscle mass we're able to retain as we get older and more importantly, how strong it is. So very, very strong evidence. People who are weaker tend to have a higher risk of dying um, from all causes. But essentially, you can think about it's not only how long you live, it's the quality of your life. If you can retain strength into your old age, well, we're not talking about lifting heavy things, but if you can't sit down and stand up of a chair without someone helping you, well, then you can't go to the toilet by yourself. You can't um, dress yourself. So if you're able to, you know, go into the gym, squat, lift heavy things, that means that you'll be able to carry out the basic live or functions of living as, as you get older. You'll be able to dress yourself. You'll be able to carry the shopping. Like I do joke to people that we're nearly told when you get older, sit down, relax. That's a terrible thing. And I don't know if anyone's ever been told to go help your granny with the shopping. Well, if you love your granny, you make her carry that shopping in. That's going to save her life in the long run and for for good measure, throw an extra few bags into her hand to make her work. Because when it comes to training older adults, I think people sometimes are afraid that they're fragile, but they're not. They're, They're resilient. And in fact, when we look at, say, the kind of leading body, the ACSM, they specifically warn against underdosing and underloading older people. So older people shouldn't be afraid to be in the gym environment, to be lifting heavy weights. Um, people think, oh, it'll hurt your back. We hurt ourselves and get injured when we're too weak to handle the demands of what we're trying to do. So getting stronger, it's going to lead to better health outcomes and better quality of life for older people. Uh, 53106, Sean and Scary's in touch. Uh, maybe if I might put this to you. Do the panel think we're putting kids into high performance panels too early and helping them develop and missing late developers and late strivers to sport? Yeah, um... I, you come at this from two things like I, I do think it's important like athletic development is, is good for your health you know as, as well as um, around performance and I think we probably don't do a good enough job in terms of making our young men and women robust um, individuals and giving them those early practices like PE would still be probably not at the stage it should be in in, in schools for example so I don't think there's an issue integrating it into sport um, uh, it's it's probably timing, um, and, and Des will have a, a view on this. We had a good chat about it at our sports science meeting around this notion of multi-sport participation and, and specialising, and when do you move into that talent space? And really, it looks like it's 15, 16, 17 um, that you'd really up with. So we would like to build a system where clubs are able to give that athletic development support. We, we want to develop coaches. We want to make clubs kind of self-sufficient 
to be able to do this work themselves and integrate it into their coaching so that all kids, not just the ones who move into the talent stage, are getting this kind of extra specialist support around the strength and conditioning or psychology or nutrition or whatever it is. But yes, there will be a time when they need to progress through and they need to become able for that, that adult level. We have a big issue in women's sport, like for Camogie football, when you're 16 or 17, you can play adult. Um, bear in mind that usually ladies footballers and Camogie players are less exposed to the life of athletic development. And they're 16, 17, 18, playing against 28, 29, 30 year old women. So, you know, the, there's a big issue there as well that, you know, kind of speaks to us having to work on this and, and make sure our young kids, those who move to the talent space are ready for the elite phase, but also just that everybody is, is healthy and robust enough for the reasons David, David spoke about as well in terms of healthy aging. Uh, 53106, uh, excellent program. My son is on a placement in Stellenbosch, South Africa. Des gave a course there recently. Is there a podcast of this show? There will be on the OTB Sports Network, uh, the OTB Sports app, and wherever you get your pods after this. Thanks from Tony and Mayo. Um, David, Nolan, I've lost three stones since January the 1st, completely through diet. When you're talking about S&C and nutrition, I know you're doing a study on nutrition. Where's the balance? How, how, what, are your, what are your learnings? What are your findings in terms of that? Um, well, first of all, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, to keep it off now. Yeah, th- well, that does be the hard bit. Maintaining tends to be the hard bit. Um, so when it comes to the, the interaction between exercise and nutrition, we, we generally view them as, as separate entities, but they, they are intertwined. One influences the other. Yes, when it comes to weight manipulation, so just putting your body weight up or down, that is controlled by energy balance, the amount of calories in versus calories out. That's pretty much undisputed despite what anyone may say and we might get angry texts about that but that's what drives it if you burn more calories than you take in you will lose body weight your body weight will go down now your body then has to choose well what do i get rid of do i get rid of the muscle mass or do i get rid of the fat ideally we want to get rid of fat and retain all that valuable muscle mass so we have to give the body a signal or a stimulus to keep that muscle mass and the two primary ones that does that is first eating enough protein that you're getting protein in the diet but more importantly exercise if we're using the muscles it is use it or lose it so if we resistance train strength train it gives the body a signal to hold on to that muscle mass and then one other interesting thing is when we look at studies of people losing the same amount of weight loss through the same calorie restriction those who had less sleep and poor quality sleep tended to lose more muscle and less fat even though the body weight loss was the same so you know it's kind of holistic that we're getting good quality sleep in as well will make a big factor and sleep actually affects your food choices and your willpower then as well so it's important also Hugh Gilmore I was kind of reading uh, some uh, research before I spoke to you today and uh, in performance psychology for strength and conditioning there was one uh, like critical thinking in psychology how to spot bull and fluff so what, what is the bull and fluff if you might be able to elaborate on that Within psychology, um, and I think within a lot of professions, there's essentially ideas of creating concepts that then can be sold, essentially who's getting the money from it. So within psychology, one of the things that's very common is growth mindset and saying that we need a growth mindset. But a growth mindset is essentially a set of beliefs which indicate that you have the capacity to grow um, in whatever endeavor it is. But actually in life, in real applied life, there are some things that we can't get better at. There's some things that can't improve and where we have to accept hard reality. And what's interesting is researchers come up with the concepts, they create books and market them, they make money off books and, and things like that and build a reputation. And we get this over skewing of some academic knowledge into the into the world of psychology, but the same happens within strength and conditioning. You know, you've got things like muscle confusion is was the old one and other things like this. So again, the cultures within sport determine where the flaws exist. I know one intercounty manager who did a one rep max test on the dumbbell fly and ripped the pack off a young athlete. And you kind of think of like, where did where did that manager get the idea that they do a one rep max test on an accessory idea or an accessory exercise? And that's that's where it is there's a lack of critical thinking about how do i apply what i'm trying to do for long-term benefit and what are the risks and drawbacks behind this because nobody has 100 percent right answer but a lot of people have very wrong answers and that's where good questioning and good critical thinking comes into play and a simple way that your listeners should listen to to take home is if i'm doing something part of what i'm doing is wrong and has a risk and a contraindication and if i don't know what that is 
then I'm not actually in a performance environment. I'm in an environment where I think I'm doing the right thing. And that's a dangerous place because we all believe our own hype. Des, you must have seen a lot of hype, but you've also seen at elite level at Arsenal and also in rugby as well, players and people execute under extreme pressure. Could you see it happening in terms of the work you're doing day to day that we were in a good space here for the, these things to, to occur? Um, yeah, executing under pressure. It's, it's uh, an important thing to prepare for. And I, I have seen some excellent coaches help the players get ready. And I've seen a coach delay the bus. I've seen a coach um, um, not have the kit arrive till the last moment. I've seen a coach... Deliberately change. now? Oh, deliberately. Just because they're at the end of the day, these are under 18, under 16 teams. If Arsenal win the under 16 league, there isn't one. Or the under 18 league, there is one. It's not, not the end of the world. It wasn't that thought process in the club. It was about developing players. So literally changing the side of formation just before kickoff. Um, half time, uh, Kwan Mi Ampadu, brilliant coach from Dublin. He, he, he's, he's in Vancouver now. He literally just didn't go in at half time, Let, left it up to the players themselves. Um, and in, in, in Arsenal Academy, it was always about high challenge, high support. So we want to push those players into those challenging scenarios. We'll support them. And it was about like playing those young players up early. Um, playing them in a more challenging environment, putting pressure on them, getting them ready for that. Now it's very hard to, to reproduce the uh, the environment of the Premier League match. That's why going on loan as well was a great challenge for these young players. Uh, some of them went on loan on the continent and I went to visit them and it was challenging for them. Um, so preparing them is very important and coaches have a big responsibility with the support of the science and medicine people to create that environment to, of high challenge and high support. Unai Emery did not want an environment, Arsenal, you told me, Des, of uh, having Kerry Goldbutter around. That we, were, we were chatting, yes, and, and Arsene Wenger was very pro Kerry Gold, and Unai came along, and it was one of my sad days in Arsenal. I only had one, and, and he changed it. Yeah, El President Butter, I think, appeared. I was very disappointed. I, I, I said it to him, and I had to bring my own little stash of Kerry Gold into the fridge, but no, no big deal, really. That's and why I, they lost to Liverpool during the week, you can definitely <laughs> tell. He's probably brought that to Villarreal. Um, injuries, uh, avoiding injuries and in the SNC environment is crucial, isn't it, Des? And what, are there any mm. tips you can give on that? Well, I, I, I really share this often. Um, it was great foresight by, by Arsene Wenger, Colin Lewin, the head physio in Arsenal. They did realise reflective practice is very important in performance, that there was some challenging situation with injuries with young players. If we look back at poor Jack Wilshere's career, um, huge amount of injuries through that career, went up early, may have not been prepared as, as much as he could have. The club really wanted to invest in strength and conditioning, science and medicine. Um, coaches worked together, conditioners, psychologists, um, physios. Things were put in place. Um, prior to that, you had players like Benicophobi, two ACLs, a lot of par stress fracture in backs in young players. But with all these things in place, it did bring down those injuries. The records were taken every year. We could see a big drop once there was smart practice, once the coaches implemented good volume and intensities. There was high intensity training at the right time. There was athletic development to support those players. And that did bring down uh, things like ACLs, par stress fractures, um, all those days lost where players should be training and developing and, and moving on. So. I, I do think we can help reduce the risk of injuries. Preventing all injuries is impossible. They're going to happen. It's sport. Uh, but I think a team that works well, a coach that works well with a conditioner, uh, can help reduce the risk of injury. And that helps with performance. Just to finish, folks, um, your role models, the past, now, athletes that you've looked up to in terms of getting out of the best out of their body, in terms of S&C or performance, um, doing the right things. Aoife, who have you, who have you admired? Who have you looked up to? Oh God, when I was younger, it was more skills based. I don't think I would have even noticed that they ran fast. I think um, I was a big hurling fan and if, if you were good at hurling, like um, I would have lo looked up to Veronica Curtin maybe. Um, loved Henry, Brian Wheel and DJ Carey was you know, it was all about their their skills. Um, and then maybe as I moved into this career, I was lucky to work with, with Cora Stond for a short while in Mayo. And, you know, she she just has that kind of athletic I'm a freak, I suppose, that she, you know, and still doing it at such a high level. So, yeah, initially was more skill oriented and probably have started to admire the the, the athleticism that you see in particularly in inter-county athletes. Um, 
in both men's and women's at the minute only of late. Hugh Gilmore, who do you admire sports-wise? Well, growing up playing hurling and Ballycran, DJ Carey was obviously a big one. Um, but I think the interesting thing is that when I met him and listened to him talk, um, he mentioned that role lifting was the most important skill. And unfortunately, my research on uh, notational analysis and hurling found out that it wasn't. So I don't think you should have role models or at least pay too much heed to them. Uh, just listen to the facts, maybe. <laughs> OK, fair enough, You Yourself, David? Um, I suppose there's two that uh, stick out for me. Um, I, I like that kind of idea that you know you can judge people by who you wouldn't go for a pint with who you'd go for maybe one and who you'd go for a rake of pints with and I suppose if I was going out on, on, on the tear uh, Shane Lowry would probably be yeah. someone I, yeah. I, I'd be out there with um, I think everyone's just he's in great form at the moment and he, he hasn't lost I suppose where he came from he's, he's and he gives back to his community but I think uh, of recent I think you can't overlook Katie Taylor as arguably one of our best ever athletes in terms of what she's done for the sport and in terms of her dominance of of that sport and the way she's carried herself throughout her whole career, I think is one you have to look up to. It is the hardest sport, I think. Boxing is the hardest sport. I had Sonny Bill Williams on the show a few months ago and he's a World Cup winner in league and union. Um, and it's the hardest sport, he said, is boxing, which is, which is absolutely interesting. And Des Ryan, for you? Yeah, it's, it's an unusual one, but I said it before, Kim Little. Right. A Scottish international, Arsenal women. My office was just at the, looking down over the gym. So you had the, the adult men's team, women's team, youths. She went through an ACL injury. She was in there every day for six months, two, three times a day. I've never seen anyone do the exercises as diligently uh, with the attention. And I, I couldn't help myself. I had to go down one day, six months into it, shake her hand and say, I've never seen anyone train as hard as this. And we both got kind of emotional. Because if I think back, I've seen a lot of top people like Paul O'Connell, Jerry Flannery, Michael Meehan, but she was, is phenomenal. Fascinating. The Irish SNC Conference 2022 taking place next Saturday, May 14th in Bishopstown, GA Club County, Cork. This interactive conference will bring together the best minds and practitioners in strength and conditioning for a series of talks, panel discussions, workshops and networking opportunities. Tickets available for the event at irishscnetwork.com forward slash conference 2022. Uh, David Nolan, um, you're organising the conference. The best luck with it. Des Ryan, the future of SNC, the future of strength and conditioning is? Is the community, is schools is primary schools, is clubs, is getting as many people as active as possible in Ireland, ingrained in every environment. And once we do that, we'll dominate world sport. Future is, David? I think that's it, to realise that SNC expands well beyond just elite sport and should be in every facet of society, sport and, and community with older adults right down to kids. Aoife Lane, the future in your, in your field of sports science, what would you like it to be? I think working with and through coaches and all of the other disciplines of sports science. And Hugh Gilmore, the future in your area of psychology, performance psych? I suppose a bit more critical thinking and a bit more collaboration with communities. OK, Hugh and Aoife, thanks so much for coming on Zoom. Thanks, folks. Bye. And uh, David and Des, best luck at the conference and thanks so much for coming into the studios of Off The Ball here in News Talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Pleasure. The best luck next week. And uh, this is Off The Ball Saturday on News Talk. We're going to... Switch codes now. We're going to catch up on all things at the Aviva Stadium ahead of Munster and Toulouse. Remember, you got commentary of Leinster against uh, Le Leicester at the Welford Row from half five on air till eight o'clock this evening. We're also going to chat racing after this break.